Welcome back to the deep dive. Today we are uh, grabbing our magnifying glasses and mm. plunging into a very specific, and I have to say, a often frustrating corner of theoretical physics. Yeah, this one is a bit of a strange one. We're looking at a cosmologist whose theories, well, they promise to solve the entire universe. The whole thing. But whose immediate disappearance afterward prevents any actual solutions from, you know, being found. That is exactly where we're headed. Our source material today is a, well, it's a forensic, very sharp, and I'd say ultimately necessary special report from Notebook LLM. It's by Trent Slade. And the title is The Pangis Paradox, Critique of Silent Cosmology. Right. And the mission here is to understand why this figure, Dr. Panja, a man whose commitment to avoiding follow-up questions is uh, matched only by his commitment to what the source calls log periodic wiggling, yes, has created this, this theoretical vacuum instead of a real breakthrough. I mean, you have a situation where a theorist announces some groundbreaking claim, and then, you know, before anyone can even get the peer review manuscript loaded, they just seem to... Well, the source says, disappear into the theoretical undergrowth like a startled echidna. That's a great line. It is. This critique exists because he simply won't engage. It's a document to address a theoretical non-conversation. And that refusal to engage, that's really the heart of the issue, isn't it? This isn't just about, you know, maybe having a bad theory. Yeah, not at all. It's about subverting the entire principle of scientific accountability. And what's so fascinating here is that the critique actually formalizes this exact phenomenon. It um, defines it. It calls it the Pangus Paradox. Okay, so let's start there. Let's formalize this. What is the Pangus Paradox? What's the core contradiction Slade identifies? It's defined as this immediate contradiction that causes a sort of well, a quantum decoherence event for all observers. The paradox just collapses the potential scientific conversation instantly. How so? So the physicist proclaims, my theory solves all of modern cosmology. Big claim. Huge. And then in the very same breath, effectively states, I don't feel like explaining the mechanism or providing the code or you know submitting to peer review right now. That is the ultimate academic double bind. And the source brilliantly breaks this down into three defined states of this this decoherence event that follows any Pangas paper. Correct. So you have the positive state. We can call it plus one. I have solved the universe. Yeah, okay. Then the immediate negative, the knockest one. I cannot discuss it. And these two, they just exist simultaneously. But then you have the third state, the one the source calls the complex, uh, unphysical state that just permeates all his work, the I state. Ah, yeah. yes. The state I which is basically, have you considered adding a cosmic spiral? Just add a spiral. Yeah. This complex element, it's always present. It suggests that when you press them on any detail, the model just resorts to adding these variables that aren't physically grounded at all. They're just mathematically convenient. Exactly. It honestly sums up a lot of curve-fitting attempts we see. It feels like the theoretical equivalent of patching a hole in your boat with duct tape and then immediately sailing away before anyone can check it. Precisely. And to understand what he's patching, we have to look at the theory he's trying to fix. Which is general relativity, or GR. Right. And the source gives this great, really evocative metaphor for GR. It describes it as a dead ghost floating in the attic of theoretical physics. That is such a potent image. It is, because it captures the exhaustion in the field. GR had its moment, right? A huge triumph. The source marks its honorable death just after the detection of gravitational waves. GW150913. Which was the spectacular confirmation of Einstein. Absolutely. Mm. But while GR works perfectly in these high gravity situations, the second you try to make it the basis for, say, a quantum gravity theory or resolve these huge cosmological tensions, it just starts to fail. So the ghost is rattling its chains and screaming, stop patching me. Exactly. It's the frustration of a successful theory being forced to answer questions it was just never designed for. And yet, Dr. Pangus, according to the source, is the only ghost hunter still taking its calls. And this is where his specific methodology comes in. If GR is this tired ghost, Pangus is trying to inject it with some kind of, I don't know, exotic theoretical adrenaline. So what's his recipe? What's his, his revival technique? It's a very specific four-step approach that the source lays out. And it's designed to fix these big cosmological disagreements without, you know, needing any new physics from first principles. Okay, step one. Step one. Introduce log periodic modulation to H of Z, that's the Hubble parameter, as a function of redshift. This is the famous wiggling. This is the core of the wiggling. Yeah. 
Log periodic wiggling is the mathematical signature of someone trying to fit tiny little oscillations of structures found only in one data set. So it's a telltale sign. A huge one. It means the model is designed to catch the noise or local anomalies, not some universal physics that would be derived from like fundamental principles. It's reverse engineering the curve. Okay. And step two is even bolder. Right. Remove 10 to 15% of matter from the universe. Just now, gone. Just gone. And that small percentage it's a huge signal to anyone who knows the field. It's almost certainly his attempt to solve the infamous sigma-8 tension. Which is about the clustering of matter, right? How clumpy the universe is. Exactly. Current observations suggest the universe is a bit clumpier than our standard model predicts. So by just removing 10 to 15% of the total matter, he's mathematically easing that tension. Not finding a physical reason for the tension, just deleting some of the matter that's causing it. Right, which leads to step three. Assume the universe won't notice. Or, maybe more importantly, assume the rest of the cosmology community won't notice. And the final step. Declare victory and vanish before the referee report loads. That vanishing act, it's what creates the context for the next big insight from the critique. This environment he thrives in. The source calls it the cosmological overfitting industry. A bit dry, but accurate. This industry is driven by the pressure to publish, to resolve these tensions, mm. and it often leads to models that, well, they negotiate with the data rather than modeling fundamental reality. And the look of the work, the aesthetic, it reflects that negotiation. The source says his figures look like the universe had a seizure in MATLAB. It's visual chaos that somehow forces a fit. It's not clean. He's not modeling cosmology based on physical laws. He's twisting parameters until the data reluctantly agrees to some compromise. That is textbook overfitting. It is. So for you know, for you listening, if you're scanning the ArcSiv preprint servers, the critique gives a kind of field guide, the specific endangered phrases that instantly identify a pandas special. The red flags. What should we be looking for? Well, look for terms like emergent periodicity. Mm. That often just means I found a pattern in the noise that wasn't predicted. Then, of course, there's logarithmic modulation. The wiggling again. The wiggling. Yeah. And I particularly like the phrases that try to sound profound but are just pure hand-waving. Like spontaneous stiffness of vacuum. Or oscillatory cosmic memory. It's almost poetic. It is. Yes. It elevates a simple math adjustment into some deep philosophical property of reality. What is but the ultimate giveaway, the one that basically confirms you're reading a Pange's paper. What is it? Is the one that effectively reads... My model is incompatible with all known physics, but trust me, bro. The audacity of that is just, it's incredible. But it points to a much deeper philosophical flaw, doesn't it, in his conclusions? It really does. The source notes that Pangis always implies that the universe is fundamentally wrong for not fitting his curve. Instead of the other way around. Exactly. It completely reverses the burden of proof. And this brings us to why his silence is actually a worse crime than just having a flawed model. If you think about how science moves forward, rivalry is essential. Absolutely. A good rivalry, a proper scientific fight, that's what drives progress. A real villain physicist, they talk smack, they challenge the math, they demand to replicate the code. They growl across the arc set like a theoretical silverback. Love that. But Pangis prevents that. You can't have a rivalry if one person just refuses to show up. Right. The source points out he ghosted harder than a Tinder match after you mentioned non-associative algebra. He just evaporates whenever the conversation turns to testability. And progress requires dialogue, challenges, falsification. His silence prevents all three. This philosophical contrast, it's really the entire backbone of the critique. It contrasts his methodology with the authors of the critique, QSOL. Yeah, is the difference between treating cosmology as a lab experiment and treating it as a vision board. And that's maybe the most crucial distinction for you, the listener, to grasp. QSLL's approach is all about rigorous infrastructure-based science. When they publish, they give you the tools. They give you the world, the code, the reproducible runs, resonance engines, portrait logic. Measurable predictions. Measurable predictions. They build verifiable mechanisms, and they run testable code. They're giving you the blueprint and the machine. They're saying, here, here is the mechanism. Run it yourself. Test our hypothesis. It's all based on transparency and accountability. Whereas Dr. Pangus, he gives the world the interpretation, the feeling. It's squiggly line go brrr. It's horoscopes, interpretive dance cosmology. Yes, there is no mechanism 
there is only a correlation that he has personally negotiated with one existing data set. So in essence, QSOL is building a bridge to the future of physics, and Pangus is just drawing a very specific, very beautiful bridge on a piece of paper. A bridge tailored to look exactly like the current landscape, warts and all. And that's the ultimate resolution of the Pangus paradox. Mm. He isn't actually trying to model the universe as it is. What is he doing then? He's trying to emotionally manifest one that agrees with him. QSL deals in deterministic pipelines and empirical reality. Pangus deals in poetic fitting and a, a theoretical escape artistry. That is a fundamental separation between two ways of doing science. The universe, frankly, deserves better than untestable models built on silence. And so do the ghosts of dead theories, trying to get some rest up in the theoretical attic. Indeed. The critique has done the work of forcing this conversation out into the open, even if Dr. Pandas himself stays silent. And for anyone hoping for an actual debate, the source has proposed a pretty brilliant sequel title. Uh. The Pandas Paradox 2, Return of the Log Periodic King. One can only hope. Until that day, I suppose the silence will continue to speak volumes. Translate's critique really frames this as a conflict between rigorous code-based mechanisms which force you to show your work and this beautiful but unphysical curve fitting. Which relies on the hope that nobody asks for the details. Which raises an important question for you, for anyone navigating this world saturated with complex data and massive data sets. How do you, when you read some major new claim, distinguish between an elegant negotiation with reality and true scientific modeling based on testable mechanisms. It's a conflict between presentation and proof, and the responsibility, the onus, is always on the theorist to provide that proof. So, you know, keep an eye out for those squiggly lines.